Episode 37, Todd Sawyer, Atlas Bistro. In the house. In the house. With a sword. There's nothing better than somebody wrong. somebody bringing <laughs> weapons right. into the house. I love Arizona. This has got to be our this is our first ever episode uh, with somebody sabering a bottle. Yeah, first time we have somebody sabering. Yeah, this is the right time. I'll, I'll, I got this. Here, yeah. I'll narrate it. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, Todd Sawyer. He's gonna saber a bottle here with his own custom made. How do you spell this thing, by the way? Lagulil. How do you spell it? Or Le- pronounce it. Laguil. S W R D. Yeah. Laguil. That. Lagul. Lagul. You, you need All right, to hold on. Enunciate uh, it. Enunciate it properly. In front. Damien, stand outside the door and see if he hits you like a firing like squad. A target? Yeah. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> oh. Todd. <laughs> well, I guess we're not sabering anything tonight. We sabered it. Force a fucking habit. Oh, fuck me. I just started taking the cork out. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. That's the best Charger show ever. Well, I guess we're not going to show you how to saber on this episode. <laughs> we can saber Prosecco. <laughs> can you saber Prosecco? We're going to have to edit something in. Hold on. <laughs> edit that out and we'll free. We should edit it where he pops the cork and the room just blows no, up. we got to keep that. That was epic. <laughs> Holy crap, that like, was a did, huge did, failure. Did you, you, hold on, let me get another. We had the door open and everything. <laughs> Well, shit. <laughs> that was. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Force of habits are really weird when you do that. That is hilarious. You just like get into the same rhythm you do something your entire life, and then all of a sudden you try to do something different. And nope. okay, oh man. Yeah, go shut the door. <laughs> We're going to have to do episode number two with you. All right, episode two, the redux. That, that just... <laughs> we have to do it again. Uh, oh, my go God. Post-production. That could not have been any better, to be honest. That was... <laughs> Honestly, the only thing that would have made that better is if he sabered that, shot the cork out the door, and hit somebody going by at the same exact moment. Is that like a version of like premature ejaculation right there? Dude, he, you, you blew your load way too early. The look on your face, too, as soon as you did it, you're like, oh, fuck. Saber sword, by the way. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like being back in college again. There you go. College? Man, that really? Was High that school? the first time for you? All right, there's a... Well, I mean, the first time I made a mistake. The first time somebody slept with you? <laughs> no. That was a mistake. Yeah, so huh? you should be able to pull that right up next to you. You can move it around, move it down, move it around. Just play with it. There you go. Just Smack it up, flip it, touch it, it down. Touch it a little bit. Cheers. Oh, no. Well, cheers to Cheer, that, guys. Cheers, cheers to the sabering uh, lesson. Right. That was awesome. Well That's, done. On today's like podcast, Todd Sawyer from Atlas Bistro shows us how we don't saber bottles. <laughs> I'm glad you brought the saber over for that. It's the least I could do. <laughs> so did you just... Oh, you started undoing the cage. No, I was undoing the cage as you always do, and then just forced a habit. I just started pulling the cork out like I was at work and tried to shove it back in, but you can't shove it back in once you pull it out. <laughs> That might be the greatest introduction we've ever had. <laughs> Hashtag pulled out too early. Oh, my God. At least we get to drink great champagne. Awesome. Totally. So what'd you bring? I brought some Mark Hebert, grower of champagne, and one of my favorites, small production, 6,000 case uh, producer. Um, this is his Blanc de Blanc. Really, really delicious. It's a multi-vintage. I think it's 70% from 2014, 20% from 2013, and 10% from 2012. Um, so this is something we're trying to get people to do is to drink stuff other than the mainstream champagnes and the mainstream bubbles. I know we talk a lot about Proseccos and stuff you're going to put orange juice with and other stuff, but <laughs> you okay there? <laughs> Actually, that sounds a lot of CO2 in it. Like I but, breathed in the, uh, the, the effervescence and it just... God, everybody's having a, a mis- de- <laughs> misfunction right now. Oh, well, you just had I a stroke. <laughs> Uh, Should we just start again? No. <laughs> yeah, put the cork back in the champagne. Let's try and savor that. Oh my god! But really, I mean, there's such great champagnes out there for the price. I mean, comparable. This is probably comparable to something like a Vuv or something. Vuv. Vuv. Maybe. Price wise, yeah. This is about fifty five dollars at most retail wine shops, and, and no offense on a wine list about about a quarter. No offense to Vuv Clicquot, but this is a way better product. Yeah, yeah. this is fantastic. Vuv spills more champagne in a day than they probably make in a year. 
right? 5,800 cases. So grower champagne, they grow, make, and do every part of the champagne process. What makes it a grower, or what makes a grower champagne? They own the, is it like saying a state, or is it just they have a whole crazy other process with it? No, it just has to do with owning the land that you're making the champagne from. Okay, so Vov like buys grapes. Vov buys from over something, two or 3,000 different and this vineyard is holders. Their vineyards, their winemakers, their, everything's processed through them. This is Mark Ebert family, and the son's taken over, and they've been doing it, I think, for 55 years. They've been in the special club for about 35 years, and Terry Thies brings us in, and everything they touch is pretty much gold in my book. And the how, special club has some fantastic champagne in it. Now, for an average consumer, how hard is it to actually find stuff like this? Are you going to find stuff like this at big package stores? Or do you have to go to a little shop? Do you have to have it special ordered? I mean, is this um, something you need to kind of know about to get something of this quality? You just need a wine merchant you could trust to put you into the right wines. And so there's about 28, well, uh, 28 members of the special club, but I'm not sure how many growers are out there. And there's a lot of producers, and, and a good way to look is to see who the importer is. Same way as you taught us to find Italian wine by looking for Vias or Jorge Ordonez for some Spanish wine or Kermit Lynch for, Kermit Lynch for French oh, wine. Skernic. But yeah. if you see Terry Thies as the importer uh, working with Skernick, but uh, it's going to be one of your best bets for great quality champagne. We've talked a lot about Skernick wines and Terry Thies selections. I mean... Unfortunately, they had a lot of trouble selling these on the West Coast, so they actually opened up their own distributor out in California because it was very difficult to find a wholesaler that could understand and sell this product. And it's great. It's listed as a premier crew, but it would almost be classified as a grand crew. Um, these families love what they do. They make passion champagne, and it's so they something have premier, I like to drink. They have premier crew and grand crew in champagne? Of course. What, which one is like a good example of a grand crew? Because I'm assuming Cristal and Dom are not that at all. Oh, they would be. Would they're, they be? They're tete de cuvee for the big houses. It's okay. all going to be Grand Cru from the best vineyards that are listed out there. And that's why they have that kind of price tag to them. Do they do Grand Cru or is this their best one? No, he does Grand Cru as well. This is a Premier Cru because I think it's something about 70% Premier Cru vineyards in here and 30% Grand Cru vineyards. So okay. it has to be categorized by the... Come in the little black lesser. box. Or is this is no, this isn't one of the special clubs. The uh, okay. special club is only one wine produced out of their whole lineup. Okay. So it's their Tetu Cuvée for that year. But they also, I think he makes 10 different champagnes. He makes a Blanc de Blanc, Blanc de Noir, a Brut, a Reserve, single parcels, etc. And Mark Dude, Everett's been one of my favorites. This is fantastic. This is like the style that I like where it's not like it doesn't have that crazy bready, yeasty characteristic too much. It's just a little bit back there, but it's still like really crisp and refreshing. How many, uh, you've had drank a lot of champagne in your life. What Do you have one that you were like, holy shit, this is the best champagne I've ever had, or one that just sticks out in your mind that was like, what the fuck? Um, was fortunate Andres. to have a guy that owns a cool company called Liquid Assets. Jeremy Ringel was in for his birthday party. We did a big party, and basically all the champagne, anything he wants, he can get wine-wise, and he decided to open up a 1988 salon magnum and it was probably the best bottle of champagne i've ever had and not to get on the salon train because normally it's not my style and not my favorite but this 88 was something memorable kind of the champagne you want to drink with an eyedropper and just savor do you like older <laughs> champagnes or like more newer i guess more recent released champagnes um i typically like champagne with a little bit of age on it so it kind of settles down the effervescence isn't so Potent. intense <laughs> in your face etc but for me, I think it's more about the producer and the vintages. So years like 02 are wonderful, 04, 06, 95, 96, 90, et cetera. But so you do something called Saber Sundays, right? Saber Sundays. That's kind of like your thing where you go and you actually saber bottles, not just pull the corks out. And <laughs> Exactly. Every Sunday I relax and it's my day off. So I like to set it up by having a great, typically a bottle of grower champagne, ice it down, saber it into the uh, Shoot it into backyard. your neighbor's yard. And then just uh, sip on some champagne. Do you have, like, your kids are, like, they play fetch with, like, the uh, corks trying to find them? Or do you find them? Or do your neighbors just find them randomly in their yards and in their pool? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> like, no, they don't fly as far as you imagine. They probably fly about 10 yards or so. And so my son likes to dig around for them and go, like a, go retrieve them. He's like a bird, bird dog? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> 
<laughs> I saw a unique thing. So on, I think it's Rare Wine Co.'s Instagram page. They're always showing different, unique, fun sabering techniques. People use the bottom of glasses. And I saw one that was a, like a master pool player. And he set the bottle up on the end of the ice thing, and he sat there with his pool stick and went, pop, and just popped it off with a cue stick. Huh. I thought that was pretty neat. I mean, if you have any hard object, you could probably saber it. Yeah, but that's still, it's got a, a rounded tip. I think that'd be kind of difficult. I guess if you hit it just right. Got to strike it just right, I think. I've done it before with a champagne glass has been pretty cool, but I tried to recreate it in front of a group of people and it did not work. <laughs> I just <laughs> kept whacking the... it and I thought I was going to break the champagne glass, I love so I just the, pulled the cork out. Those videos where people sit there and they take it and they saber it and the bottle just explodes in their hand and they're like, what the fuck? Or the one where they uh, the girl sabered it and it fell out of her hand, hit the ground, and she looked at it and just sprayed her right in the face when it, it hit the ground. French Laundry, where they did like the 15 liter last year. Yeah, the video that went viral. Viral, yeah. The guy, instead of, he just like, chopped down on it oh. and it just exploded like a five yeah, like nobody's definitely said, hard like, I've, the I've first swing a, went no don't do that <laughs> a magnum is the largest i have but once the glass starts getting really thick it has to be just beyond ice cold and has to be a really high quality champagne because the glass isn't so thick something like vuv and other stuff a lot of those bottles end up shattering because it seems like it's almost in a cabernet bottle at this point i mean i've done it with cava's a lot i've actually never done it with prosecco's but i've definitely done it a lot with cava does it have to be a specific? It has to be like traditional method because doesn't the pressure have to be so high in the bottle for that to work properly? Like that's why I thought you can't do it with like forced carbonated bottles. I don't know. We can get a bottle of Prosecco later tonight and try it. And see. I mean, we're going T to. T Todd can have uh, take two on this. <laughs> I'd like to redeem myself. It's, um, We've only been talking about sabering a bottle on this show for like weeks. <laughs> The first guy who shows up with his own custom saber sword. Is saber sword or just saber? Saber. Just saber. Just saber? Yeah. Doesn't even get to use it. Now, to your defense, <laughs> though, today was tasting day at the restaurant and yep. the wine shop. So you probably tasted 50 wines today, maybe more. Definitely over three or four hours, about 50 plus wines. And some good stuff, too. Yeah, I it was mean, nice. A lot of people came through and let us try everything. It's seldom we take it for granted but not too many other people drink everything from champagne to port in the same day Every, you know multiple different countries represented and it's really fun it's a cool thing being part of the buying experience and i think it's another reason why to support your local wine merchant it's so true i mean the people that work at the big package stores don't try 50 wines every wednesday and don't try the best of everybody's books I mean, even though somebody came in today, like, was it uh, Venge came in today, mm -hmm. and we tried through five or six of his wines, you might only bring in one or two, but now you don't know what the whole entire portfolio tastes like, and if somebody comes in with a certain request, or we're talking about one of those wines for holidays, how perfect it would be, like, just to bring in it for holidays, because you know it's going to sell, and it's going to sell well. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a good perspective of what they can do horizontally, instead of just one wine and knowing only that wine by them, and kind of, you know, finding what works for you, because... You know, you got to find work works for your customer, but also as a as a wine buyer, you got to be passionate about what you're selling. When there's a lot of things out there, so you've owned this restaurant in town now for 19 years. This is our 19th year. Not many restaurants in Scottsdale last 19 years. Yeah, most get wise and quit or do something <laughs> else after, <laughs> after the first lease. I'm the only one that just keeps going and going and going. You're I'm glutton for punishment. Even some of the most famous mm -hmm. ones you thought would never close are are gone to this day. I mean, as much as we used to love something like Cashmere's Wine Bar, I mean, it's no longer there. I mean, that had a run of about, what, 15 years maybe? I feel but like that was more based on other circumstances than him but wanting it, but to close. That's, well, that's, but everything a, that's, a, story of, that's a story of every yeah. restaurant. I mean, even something like, you know, George at Frazier's. His landlord passed away. The son took over, doubled his rent. He had to move on. Yeah. You know? No, think, it was crazy. We had gone through... We did an event with, speaking of Cowboy Chow and Peter... An event called Savor, Swizzle, and Sip, or something like that, in maybe 2008, 2010. And to go through that book I had seen recently, I would say out of the 50 restaurants that participated, there's about three or four that were still around. Everybody else had gone on to another project or something else. But it is funny to say that we were watching. I think I was with you. We were watching a video of people talking about old restaurants they went to and they were naming them off. And you were just like, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. They're still around. And yeah, 15 later, you're like, dude, I can recognize three of those things that were in like a certain area and location. Well, two of the oldest that were in Scottsdale just closed. You had the Italian restaurant that just closed. The Grotto. 
And so did the Don and Charlie's, or that was Don and Charlie's. Don and, Don and Charlie's, Charlie's yes. fully bo- and bulldozed and going to be a condos. Yep. <laughs> yeah, everything becomes a condo. So, in the so end. you have AZ88 is probably the oldest one now still in. The Old bars time. made it though, like Rusty Old Town Tavern. Uh, what's the one on the corner? Coach the House. Coach House. Oh, Coach House will never go away. I don't think it can at this point, man. That's like, that's like the worst case of herpes. It's just there forever. <laughs> well, they probably also make enough money on like Christmas Eve to pay the whole year. I mean, that's good point. That place is always packed in the it's holidays. An institution. I live yeah. two. I live two blocks down the road, and during December, I just open the window up so I can get like a nice cool air. But I always hear the music from them performing outside. <laughs> so. 19 years, and in 19 years, you've had, what, five chefs, executives, heads? About maybe? five or six, yeah. That's another thing that's just mind-blowing. And uh, That's really it? Just five? As far as I ran the whole thing, yeah. By the way, for those who are listening who don't know, Todd here owns a BYOB here in Arizona, which is one of, like, what, like, four, five? Yeah, probably it's, the only fine dining yeah. BYOB. It's yeah. definitely the only I, fine dining. Well, you were doing things in this valley before everybody else. You were doing the whole farm-to-table, farm-to-fork, whatever you want to call it, before it was trendy. Before I used to always talk up your restaurant 10 or 15 years ago because you used to put the farmer's name on the menu. You had a picture in the kitchen of some like Indian chief net-catching salmon like out in the river. Like, Dip to... net salmon from Foods in Season, absolutely. There you go. <laughs> and like the original Netflix. <laughs> but the fact... no, and I think it's hard for us as well because we are always labeled as a BYOB, but I think we're one of the top fine dining restaurants in town regardless of being BYOB or not. And our opening server, Dave Johnson, who's a figure here in town, was head of Slow Foods with Chris Kaufman from Rancho Pino back in the day. And that was our opening server. And we were one of the first members of Slow Foods. We were everything. Everything before it was cool. We've been doing it and we're still doing it and trying to stay relevant. Now, did you consider yourself actually fine dining 10 years ago, per se? No, I think we're like... And I still don't really consider us fine dining because I don't really... I do, I do kind of now, to be honest. I think we're gourmet, casual dining kind of deal. You know, we, we care about what we do. We make everything from scratch, but we try not to do it with the pomp and circumstance or pretense and just enjoy ourselves and let people come. And we tell them if you're comfortable in, you know, business casual or resort casual coming off the golf course or in a tuxedo going to the theater after, just if you're comfortable, we're comfortable and we want everybody to have a good time. I mean, is, I've gone nice. in there in jeans and a t-shirt and a sport coat, and I feel comfortable in there. I don't feel like I have to put on slacks by any means. I've only I've been there, I don't know, like eight, nine times now. I've only once ever wore a tie, and it was like like the first time I ever did it. It was the uh, the Friendsgiving, I think, that we did. It was the only time I... Because every other time, it's just like, yeah, sports coat, nice shirt, and a jacket, and it's great. It's such a, it's such a welcoming atmosphere, especially when everybody at the table is somebody you could be like, oh, I drank with him, or I drank with her, and I did this like a long time ago. So, like, hey, guys, how you doing? I see you. Want to come try this later? Cool. You know, we were, we were talking kind of smack about a restaurant just the other day that just opened here in town, and I said that they'll never take on the camaraderie that their other restaurant has in Chicago. Because the restaurant in Chicago, people are sharing with each other. They're buying drinks for each other. You sit down, and before you know it, you start a conversation with the person next to you. And then before you know it, you're going out for drinks after with them. In this town, that doesn't happen. People get freaked out when someone starts talking to them. They start looking at them. But at your restaurant, it happens. I've sat at that restaurant and had glasses coming from all over. I've shared with the people next to me that I don't even know. And before you know it, we're going for after drinks together. Something kind of special about that. Well, I think it's always come by not having spirits at the restaurant and having wine mostly. And so if wine comes in a big bottle, it's fun to share. People are sharing at their table. True. And then if you kind of see people that are drinking wine similar to what you're drinking, you kind of want to send something over and maybe they'll send something back and you can kind of you know, strike up a conversation and everybody that is at Atlas wants to be there. There's a lot of easier places to get to and trendier places and all those kind of boxes that they could check. But if you're at Atlas, you want to be there and it's a unique kind of right, so, atmosphere. So nightmare story about, uh, or do you have a nightmare story about a customer that came in that just didn't get your concept? brought boxed wine in there or <laughs> I got to witness one of those actually when somebody brought in a yellow tail. <laughs> yeah, we've had one cool. of everything at this point after 20 years. Sh- so. Champagne mixed with Coca-Cola or we've had the uh, uh, <laughs> customer that, you know, the the big shot with the stripper and they're bringing Dom and you're like, oh, cool. And then they start pouring Red Bull in it and making uh, oh. I forget what it's called, a Russian something or other. They and it was like, oh my goodness. And it was like a nice bottle of Dom, too. It was like an O2, nice vintage and everything like this. Oh, there's an actual <laughs> name for this champagne and Red Bull? It's a cocktail, yeah. 
And so I've had that. I've had other people bring in literally, you know, magnums of, of yellowtail and franzia and they complain that the corkage is what it is. And I can only tell them that I set the price of the corkage. I can't determine what you bring in for wine. And, but if they're comfortable drinking that, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, Your corkage fee is so low compared to pretty much anywhere else. Shh, like, don't, tell I, them, don't tell them that. We don't <laughs> want them to raise it. Well, not for us. <laughs> too late at that point. But yeah, I mean, like you go to a California and they're charging 40 dollars $50, $60 on corkage fee. And then there, people are surprised. They're like, wait, you charge a corkage fee? Like, we'll do this Arizona. It's the only place you're going to be able to do this. Otherwise, go home and drink. Like I don't people, even think most people understand what the corkage fee is for. It's both to provide, you know, Riedel Crystal for you and proper service. And we have to carry the same insurance and liability as any other place that's fully licensed. Yeah. And, and that's all that costs thing. money. And we're trying to offer a great product. And we offer it at a fair price, I think. I mean, we, we're having this discussion on something that we're, you know, sneak peek dropping on later. But we were like, well, okay, what do you do for corkage fee for wines? And uh, wines, everybody understands corkage fees. But beer was the weird one. Like... Do you throw in corkage fees on beers? It's kind of weird because, A, you're calling it something that has nothing to do with beer, corkage. Obviously, there's no cork on those kind of beers. So it's like, yeah, you're still sticking around. You're no longer cleaning glassware. But for anybody who sits there and drinks that beer, yeah, you have the service. You're taking up the seat. You know, like you're probably pouring yourself some water. We now have to still watch you. You still have to deal with the insurance. And people just don't understand. Like, there's a reason we do that. On my mm-hmm. menu in the winery, we have a $3 corkage fee. And people are like, why is it more expensive to drink a wine here than to go? And when I sit there and explain to them, well, you know, like we're washing your glasses. We're talking to you versus taking away from conversation. Like we're doing way more. They're still like, I don't get it. Like they just don't get it. So what if I bring in like a 15 year old Lagavulin? Are you gonna, is it a $15 corkage fee? We might waive that if you share it. Okay. <laughs> if not, it'd be a standard $15 corkage, but not too many people bring spirits. We kind of encourage kind of it being a wine, wine bar. Totally. Do you ever have it, people that bring like nice beers and stuff? Cause yeah, beer is becoming really trendy now. Yeah, and I think for a while when Josh Reisner uh, was our chef, he was in the homebrew society and a big beer nerd. And, you know, a lot of his beer friends would come in and they'd bring some cool vintage beers. And whether it's a Cascade series or the the other stuff that's been aged, Eclipse and different kind of whiskey barrels or, oh, yeah, those you know, crazy. beers that are hard to get one offs. And, and, and then it was kind of cool because with them, with those big beers, they love sharing that as well. And and so we've had a, a beer following for a while. At this point, we waive the corkage fee on all beers. We just make life easy. It's 15 bucks for a bottle of wine. And Hear that, that everyone? That's what it is. No corkage fees on beers, as long mm-hmm. as you share with the owners. Exactly. And if and, you have an 18-year-old Lagavulin, you should definitely probably bring that. <laughs> I mean, I, I just saw Josh, or not Josh, uh, Corey, your chef, was drinking some New Glorious beers. Yeah, we uh, Joe, the other guy in the kitchen, or another guy in the kitchen, is uh, from Wisconsin, and his parents uh, are back and forth all the time, so they always bring us some nice New Glarus beers, and hard to get outside of Wisconsin, obviously, and it's just a nice treat. Are you a big beer guy? I see you drinking wine all the time, and you get really excited over certain wines, but I don't think I've ever actually seen you, like, I, I've seen you drink beers and be like, oh, that's good, we'll bring this into the shop, but I've never seen you sit there... And been like, holy shit, I can't believe I'm drinking this beer to like some champagnes or certain wines I've seen you drink before. It's so like, uh, is there like a beer or something where you're like, dude, I would drink that all the time? <laughs> yeah, it depends upon the brewery, but I I really like the sour beers for whatever reason. Really? So, dude, I'm Sarah, man. So going up to Russian River dude. Brewing Company and, and getting to go there and try all their sour series was really awesome. And, you know, I've visited tons and tons of breweries in my lifetime and I've found some that I really like. But overall, it's kind of really heavy and... I'm not a big bitter person, and most of the beer, especially with it trending now with hazies and double IPAs and triple IPAs and <laughs> probably quadruple IPAs. It's, it's hard to saber those also. <laughs> those, yeah. those, Can you saber a bottle? Those don't really work on saber Sundays. Mm-hmm. I think you could probably saber a Duval. It's got a cork on it, super high pressure. Well, the, the whole thing about sabering, and John, you know this, right? As far yeah, as like it's the, you, it's you, the failure in the glass. You, you find the crease, wherever the crease is in the bottle... Dude, that, that one's tough on that bottle. Oh my god, where is it? See, it's, he was looking for it's it earlier. Dead center on the uh, label on the front and back. So all it's, the wine glasses are three that. piece. So yeah. it's the two sides right and the top. Is. Yep. And so if you strike it, and I believe it's bottled under seven atmospheres of pressure. So if you strike it and it's ice cold, it's, it's going to be the fail point. And so if you strike it with a blunt object, i.e., a saber, or I've used pretty much anything else. And who do you think the first person figured that out was? The first guy Napoleon? who accidentally hit something. <laughs> That'd be great. Did you use an old that's musket? Where it that's what they uh, the Is it really? Sabering. Yeah, they'd flip their sword upside down, and as they you know conquered stuff, they would saber the champagne and just drink from the bottle. And 
Really? So that's okay. That's a real thing. Mm-hmm. Holy crap, I never do that. That is Yeah, because awesome. most people think a saber is going to be sharp or you want a sharp object, but you actually want a blunt object. It's yeah, more I about the striking about of it. Yeah, both sides of that saber. Are hitting dull. it just right. Mm-hmm. That's such just a real cool gimmick because I've seen enough people try it and fail <laughs> or not try it and fail. But then, like, it seems that so hurts. simple. I've seen people use it with, like, a fork where they rolled it along, a glass, obviously, and whatnot. It's just such a weird gimmicky thing that's actually really cool if you do it right. So you and I went to college together, and we drank a lot of shitty beer and a lot of shitty cocktails and a lot of uh, SoCo sours or SoCo limes. Is what you served at the old a lot family of kamikazes. Bar. Uh... Oh, my God. But... I'm, your bar used to do bladder busters. I remember we used to break bladder busters sometimes just so we could drink Penny Guinnesses the rest of the night. What was the, the thing that got you into wine? What was the epiphany wine? I love asking people this because everybody has that epiphany wine in their life goes, now wine no longer tastes like wine. It tastes like something. My epiphany wine was Darnberg from McLaren Vale, the custodian Grenache. All right. I was drinking with, oh my God, I can't think of her name. But she was working at AZ Wine Company. I had another restaurant next door to AZ Wine Company. I went over, and Noelle was her name. She was at culinary school with my chef, Carlos. And uh, Noelle, I think she's still working up in Napa Valley. And she had opened some wine, and she asked me to taste it and wondered what I tasted. And I was like, this, 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 and this. And like, I didn't grew up from a non-drinking family, and so it was interesting to try something. And she's like, you're spot on. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I tried some other stuff, and... I realized I had a pretty sensitive palate and I was able to articulate what I was tasting. And so that wine kind of set it off where I was like, oh, this kind of makes sense to me. And instead of hanging out in my restaurant, I hung out in the wine store and eventually I got the partners at the wine store to buy the restaurant with me and or buy into the restaurant. And we turned it into Atlas as a fun BYOB spot. Yeah. Do you what's the story behind that? How, so originally you, when you bought that spot or you moved that spot, it was a sub shop. Right. It was yeah, like it was a, the second a, location of the food that we had been doing out of our bar in Tempe, across from university, because that was really successful. And so, but it was like a delivery place. weren't you weren't you doing like to go food? Like, yeah, there was maybe six tables inside, and then the majority of it was delivery to all the apartment complexes, car dealerships, businesses, et cetera. Around, we kind of did delivery before delivery was even before Uber or any of these other things were delivering things, and we were doing two, three, four, five hundred deliveries a day. And Jesus, <laughs> two thousand. Oh, wait, ninety six. Ninety six. Jesus. Ninety five. 25 years ago. So we've been doing it for a long time and that worked out well. And so we decided to build another location and ended up being next to a wine store. And so hanging out at the wine store, um, one of the partners there, Chad, had introduced me to a chef and he said, oh, I know you love food and you've always been eating everything. This guy's been cooking some events for my family. You need to try his cooking. And so I reached out to this guy, Carlos, and had him... He's like, oh, just bring over some food. And we did a market basket before I think even Chopped was a show. And so I went to the supermarket, grabbed a handful of ingredients, went over to his apartment. And on a six-inch Weber grill, he made me one of the best meals I'd ever had in my life. He had made his own bread earlier this day, and he grilled everything off. And the seasoning and the flavors were just so intense and so amazing. And come to find out, Carlos is quite the unique character. And... uh realized that he was moving back to Arizona and wanted to open a restaurant. So we got together. I was in business with my brother and sister, and I bought them out and resold the interest to uh, Carlos, the chef, and Chad, who was over at the uh, wine shop. And we decided to uh, open up a little BYOB restaurant and give it a go. Was it challenging at first? Because right now you have an amazing clientele. But for those first couple of years, how rough was it? Did people get it? Was it like... Well, it worked out well initially because there was a restaurant called Gregory's World... Gregory's Mm-hmm. World Bistro, I think it was called. Gregory Casal, yeah. he was over on McDowell and Scottsdale Road at the Papago Plaza. And he moved up north and bought El Franco's restaurant and became full service. And we're like, oh, we need a BYOB on the side of town. And we always wanted to have a BYOB and a wine store and do this, that, and the other thing. And so I still had a lease on the, on the restaurant I had. So we decided to close that down abruptly, even though it was working out well. And we decided to open up Atlas. And so we opened in April of 2001. And I think in May, we had got five stars from the Arizona Republic, one of like three or four restaurants that ever got five stars. And Howard Seftel was really generous with us. And things went from like, no one knew who we were to we were on the map and we were having a blast. And the restaurant was rocking and rolling. And then something else happened in 2001, right around 9-11. And business stopped for about two years. So we've been through 9-11 crisis. We've been through housing crisis. We've been through 
the tech bubble. We've been through, you name it. We've uh, <laughs> lots of lots of challenges. There's plenty of days where we drove around looking at all the other restaurant windows to see if anyone was at those restaurants because no one was at ours. And we scaled the staff back to me and Carlos and Chad. And I think we had one helper and we were all at least young single guys so we could work for free and sleep on the floor and do what it takes. And It's true. You think about like a big restaurant that is now down four tables in a night. They're like, oh, it's okay. It's all, We can seat 100. We're down four tables. Now we have 96 tables. Atlas has eight tables. If they lose four, that's half their business for the day. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be rough. Yeah, it was definitely. 2001 was a challenging year. Plus, not like, only for us, but for everybody. And, you know, what we've learned over all these years is it's kind of nice to be uh, nice and lean. And when things are good, we don't make as much as everybody else. But when things go south, we can cover the overhead ourselves. And it's, it's not going out of business because we've seen, as we talked about earlier, so many restaurants go out of business and... You know, bite off more than they can big chew. Big ass ones too. All those big chains are starting to take the hits because you know, I'm guessing this is just from the chain perspective. If you have 50 restaurants and one of them is your weakest link, doesn't matter whatever. It's like all right, cut that and then keep cutting. But I, I'll go to the art house occasionally. There's nobody in there, but there's 27 people working in there. I'm like, I don't know how you can keep affording these things. But if you have 30 other restaurants that can support you while it goes through certain downswings, versus yeah, if it's you and you lose four tables for your night, like well, that sucked. <laughs> Oh. oh, without a doubt. And we've seen, but even with the small independent restaurants that that get bigger than they want to be from the start as well, like, oh, we could do this and have another project in this other suite and do this, and then we'll take on two leases and then three leases. And then they don't realize that, you know, you're better off that supply and demand. If you can be full and keep people wanting it, then you're going to be a lot better off than having too much space and, just, you know, getting ahead of yourself. It kind of feels like the irony of all the chains is the very first PF Chang's that opened was probably the most amazing thing. And now they've got like, what? 18 of them, not to mention the Flemings and the 30 other restaurants. Or Sam Fox, the first time he opened a restaurant was... I think there's like 100 the P.F. Chang's in the nation right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, I mean, what they, they have like 100 Sam Fox restaurants around the country at this point. 60 or 70, I think. Yeah. And I mean, like if you go from being that single, small family thing, so all of a sudden you have a second one that's big and that third one thing, now you have to bring in a group of people and investors. Now all of a sudden you have to cut away okay well we can't use the best steak so we'll get second best steak now you have 10 restaurants okay now we'll do third best steak and we'll keep we'll just sweeten the recipe up a little bit and tweak it here and there and then all of a sudden you're fucking mcdonald's by the time it's done but you're making a billion dollars i'll just go buy my chicken from fart and smile i mean (laughs) smart and final (laughs) like you know people start cutting corners when bean counters start running restaurants instead of passionate chefs and owners you know that's the one thing i do love about your place the chefs that you have are Fantastic. How do you find the chefs that you do? Because every single time I've been to your place, and I, I so the first time I ate at your place was uh, McKinley was your chef. And then it was, I think it was Mike, and then somebody now, Corey. So I've had three or four chefs, I think, over your time. And every single one of them, while a little bit different, was amazing. And I, I just like, because I'll go, I worked in enough restaurants, and all the chefs I've ever known are like, they're nuts and they don't, they care enough, but they're never the guy who sits there and smells a sage, burnt, fresh, whatever, and sees how 800 different recipes taste that way. Where do you find people like that? Well, I'm usually looking for someone that's hungry, someone that's, you know, a chef de cuisine, a sous chef that has a ton of talent and kind of has, you know, ran its path with another restaurant and doesn't want to recreate food because most of the time it's like any sort of art form. One guy at the top decides what to do and everybody else has just got to repeat, repeat, like repeat line, yeah. and just keep making the same reproduction over and over and over again, which stifles your creativity. And after a while, you want an outlet. And I'm in a unique position because I'm not a chef as a restaurant owner. So most small little restaurants, a chef is the owner. And so you're going to do what he wants to do or that's about it. But with me, I just got to find a talented person and let them kind of, you know, as Keenan had said one day, you know, take over the cockpit and drive it the way you want and have some fun with it. And so we have somewhat of a formula that works, but it allows you unlimited amount of creativity, more than kind of anything besides owning your own restaurant will allow you to. So it's worked out really well. I mean, it works too, because then you have what is perceived as a new, you don't change a concept, but it's new. As, ah, new chef in, what's he going to be like kind of a thing? Because people always want to keep trying something new. I think it was one of Seth Tell's last articles he wrote before he left the paper was something about you, where he said, I don't know where, you, you have some magical talent finding chefs that what you do, nobody else in the Valley has been able to ever duplicate. No, I kind of got inspiration from Theo Epstein when he was running the Red Sox. And, you know, it was just, I, 
always needing to uh, find new starting pitching, whatever you got to do. And so, you know, your, your ace goes down. You got to have someone in the bullpen that's ready to uh, step up and take over. And so yeah. I've, I spent a ton of time with, you know, you guys as well as everybody else eating at every single restaurant in town, finding that thing that's interesting. And if I find a restaurant I like, I frequent it often and keep my eye on the people that I like to do that's cool things out here. That's actually a great reference because you're not going out and signing the big free agent you're identifying the kid in the farm system that's got talent and letting him shine. That's actually a, I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Theo Epstein. You know that. <laughs> yeah, he did a lot for the Red Sox yeah, and you the Cubs. And your stupid hat right now. <laughs> but I truly appreciate that reference because it's true. I mean, you found you have put so many chefs on the map. So many people have come from working with you that are now doing bigger and better things or different things. I mean, yeah, most Car have gone on to open their own restaurants, I which mean, is Car pretty cool. And Carlos is off cooking in the Mediterranean somewhere on a ship and Sam fighting with bulls. And, <laughs> you know, Josh has opened restaurants. Keenan's opened restaurants. McKinley's working with uh, Guy Fieri and doing whatever he's doing. Yeah, we did that little thing for a little bit. And then Corey just went chopped recently. I was going to get into that. How awesome is that for you and putting you guys on the map? That was probably one of the biggest things that's ever you guys have ever had to put you guys on the map globally yeah that's our first national kind of main publicity besides being in a usa today or a, another article of something like that but as far as being big public and tying it to the restaurant has been awesome you know it's helped out all of our you know credibility as well as just kind of putting us on the map as well because Corey's main goal my current chef is to win james beard and so now we're getting we just did our first james beard dinner and all that kind of stuff and so it's just kind of opening all those doors that you know, I think, you know, we've worked awesome hard and, and done support it. that. Like, you're just like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and you want to go for James Beard? Let's let's make this happen. Well, now that you don't have the uh, the clause where you can't talk about it, let's talk about the whole Chopton thing. Like, so they they filmed this, what, about a year before he at the end of the year Yeah. Wow, so was you, that long? So you apply to be on the show and then they kind of go through and you know, phone interview, written interview, et cetera. And then once that gets done, they uh, came to Phoenix, I think in January of maybe 2017, I think it was summer 2018, I think it was maybe January. And so they filmed a bunch of different Phoenix chefs and stuff like that. And we obviously had to sign a non-disclosure and, and couldn't talk about anything. And they did, you know, all the intro segments and all that kind of stuff. And then that got filmed in January, I think, Corey went out in maybe February. It was right around Valentine's Day. I remember because we had to run Valentine's Day without Chef. And <laughs> Nice to see that they thought of that. They're like, oh, yeah. we're going to steal your Chef on Valentine's Day. Yeah, out of a restaurant with four chefs in it. You yeah. Know? So no problem. We got that covered. And so he, so he went out and he filmed it then. And then they just tell you that, you know, we're going to get to the episode as soon as we can get it on, et cetera. And it didn't end up airing till uh, May of 2019 with uh, another fun local chef, Tammy. Uh, Doing so her. Did you know that he had won before all this, or was this like completely on a down low? It was more like a Mr. Ed, you know, hit your heel twice if you won and once if you didn't. But, you know, we didn't talk about it. We, we respected the. Uh, I didn't even know he was on. Like, you guys didn't say anything yeah, it was like to two anybody. Weeks before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we respected the rules of the show, and you know they take your prize money away if you talk about it. So you don't want to. Uh, Do they give them the prize money on the spot, or they it uh -huh. has to air? Then they give them the prize money. No, they give you the money, but they'll take it away if you screw up their system. You know, there's got to be some suspense uh -huh. in the show, and we respected that. And so it's funny. We're Sarah, excited to be part of it. Sarah loves loves Chop. Lo like she's been watching it now for a year. So when I told her, she's like, "Get the fuck out of here! This is amazing! I can't wait for this." But she watches that. Uh, and the other, the British baking thing. I think those are like the two most popular shows to watch is anything that has the bake and chopped. And now I got her into the one that you showed me, the uh, the street food one. Oh, that's amazing. It <laughs> was amazing to see this community support Corey and Tammy, though, at the launch party. Because I've been to other chopped launch parties, like airing episode premiere parties. And there would be like 10, 15, 20 people there. And that place was packed i mean yeah. hundreds of people there people cheering every single time you couldn't even hear people speak because people are cheering and chanting people's names like it was almost like we're at a sporting event no it was fun and and keenan put us up at pig and pickle and former chef of atlas as well and tammy's former stomping ground so it was all tied together and it was just uh it was a great sense of community for arizona for for the restaurant scene i wish there was more of it on a regular basis i feel like the food network is doing more stuff out here than ever before we were always kind of left out of the scene i felt 
But well, I'm I guess, a- how do you feel about the Arizona food scene? You being like a big foodie, and I can't honestly tell half the time if you like food more than you do wine or other way around. But being a big <laughs> food and wine geek. Because he's so cynical all the time. You just, he's like uh, the hardest I was dude. just at Maple and Ash in Chicago. He's so hard to Madison read. Par. Yeah. Like where, <laughs> like, would, if you looked at Arizona from like a food person, where you'd be like, man, I wish this is better or it sucks or there's like a couple good things you want it to be better. Like where does Arizona fit in the food scene? I think we have a lot of talented chefs out here in Arizona. I think a bigger problem that we have, and this was a conversation we were having earlier, is the dining, the dining public in Arizona is kind of a, a thorn in the side of a lot of restaurateurs. Everybody can only eat dinner out here from 6.30 to 7.30 at night, which puts a lot of constraints on a restaurant, why they're so big out here. You can't, you know, you've got to make money all night, you know, to have a one-hour window to take your revenue in. Not too many businesses can succeed with that, as well as they're not open to change a whole lot. So, you know, you could, you know, basically pen out the menu of 90% of the restaurants in town without even trying. And, you know, it's all circa 2005 Mm. and it's safe as could be. And so a lot of the chefs that want to do something interesting and take these chances move out of our market. So it kind of, it's, it's, it's a hard scene. And I think it, it, there's a lot of factors as well. We, are somewhat of a retirement community out here. Yeah. And so people are relocating and they like the chains because it's safe and it's easy for them. You know, there's there's not much walking and, and, and neighborhoods here, so it's hard to be able to try a place and walk down the street and have a cocktail and have like this whole kind of thing that, you know, your neighborhood can support you. You're pretty much getting in the car, driving somewhere and, and making everything almost a destination spot. And then your spot after that is a destination spot. So it's tough. I, I enjoy, for me, dining. I love when I'm in a city and I can go to a wine bar and have a glass of wine and then I leave the wine bar and I go to a place and maybe have another glass of wine and a couple appetizers. Then I have my real dinner reservation. I don't eat dessert at there. I walk off dinner a little bit and go to a place for a nightcap and a little dessert or something to share. And then maybe then walk somewhere and have another nightcap. And for me, that's like the whole experience of dining. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I've been fortunate enough to do it pretty much everywhere. And it sounds like I. It's actually I like that. Have a drink, go somewhere, have a drink and appetizers. Go somewhere, have your dinner, walk that off, and then go have. So you hit four different spots basically in one evening. Just yeah, to it's see. just kind of like a progressive dinner kind of situation. And I spend a lot of time in Portland, Oregon, and I just love it up there. It has enough neighborhoods that you can kind of do that stuff in, whether you're over on Division or if you're over in Pearl or downtown, and you can just kind of graze and go. And if you're feeling the vibe, cool, stick around. If not, you know, keep moving. As well as what I like about Portland is, you know, I started off going to Pigeon a lot and you'd go on a Monday night at 830 was the only reservation you can get. And you're like, oh, man, it's going to be late because you're used to dining in Phoenix and you get there at 830 and then six more couples come between 830 and 10 o'clock and they're just starting a tasting menu and the chefs aren't upset that you did it. They're excited because what a concept you're supporting their restaurant and they're getting to cook food for people they like. And as well, like the chefs there get to wear, you know, their tats out and a backwards baseball cap yeah. and a comfortable shirt. And they're like. Their food doesn't taste any different and the customers aren't pissed that they're not wearing a chef white and being all proper and listening to the same old jazz soundtrack. And, you know, there's a lot more fun flavor and culture. It is so weird that we have such an early dining scene here. The weather is so beautiful late at night, but you're right. Even in the the peak of season when the weather is gorgeous at night, all your reservations probably come in at 730 the latest. Like it's everybody wants us. 6.45 to 7.15 reservation. Maybe yeah, they're flexible. They want 7 o'clock, but they will go as early as 6.45 and <laughs> as late as 7.15. They're flexible. So, you know, <laughs> well, if let's not, not, let's not, no matter ourselves. how much they love your restaurant, they're going to say, man, we'll come another time. Sorry, you don't have 7 o'clock on the dock. Yeah, these are the kind right. of people who wake up at 5.45 in the morning in two separate beds that, you know, position change as they wake up and read I mean, the newspaper. I love going out at 9 o'clock in a lot of other cities. I'd love to have dinner at 9 o'clock half the time, but... You know, New York City, Portland, Seattle, like nine o'clock is not, that's standard not kind of. Yeah. Or all of Spain or all of France. That's standard. Italy. Pretty much the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we do have the golf community here. So a lot of people are up early as well as our financial communities based off New York. So they're all up early as well. So that's we do point. run into some things that do factor into us eating early. I'd, but I'd say even honestly, if you have this much sunshine all day, you get a little bit tired by the end of the evening. <laughs> you know, but you can't. You say that, but you just mentioned Portland, Oregon. They're still dealing with New York time for the financial things. But it's a much younger community from what I see. I, you know, it seems like you can go up to Portland and it's, you know, a huge group of people between 25 and 55 that 
are open-minded and flexible and, and just want to enjoy stuff. The other thing that I can't figure out here, and I think it's because people don't like stairs, is we don't have any roof deck patios. Right? I go to cities that Nothing. are cold and miserable nine months out of the year, and there's a roof deck everywhere. We have nine months of sunshine. Well, we have 12 months of sunshine, but nine months of great so sunshine. true. And we do not have a roof deck patio pretty much anywhere in town. And you could, everything here is flat because we have no, no snow, no anything. And so how hard would it be to put a second floor on and have a roof deck? With the beautiful views of Arizona. Is this your next concept? No. There's, <laughs> there's a, a really clip. gross bar next to us. <laughs> there's a... I was in San Diego recently, and that was funny that you say the rooftop thing, because the second I hit it, I was like, well, maybe we could find a rooftop bar, because it's San Diego. There's got to be something. And it was just like 50 things immediately was listed. And I'm like, damn, how do we not have this? The only place I could think of was like Casablanca in Old Town, and that's... yeah, eh, The whatever. grapevine. <laughs> the grapevine. <laughs> Oh, that smells fantastic. I could smell the grapevine thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But it's I never understood it. I go back to Boston where I'm from all the time and everything's got a roof deck and you're like, people are sitting in the snow just doing roof decking and you're going, Arizona's like 70 for like six straight months and you can't sit outside, pop a bottle of wine and just hang out. So, so, so you, if anybody's listening, want to build a rooftop patio, I will it. be there. So you've been doing food and wine now for 19 years at Atlas. You've had, I imagine almost every type of grape whatever what is it that like brings you more towards champagne and because you seem to like oregon wine a lot as well i thought that's like you've just done this so long these are the two that you're settling on no i think kind of it's, it's kind of a normal progression i think a lot of people go through but i think for me i like the low alcohol in the wine so i really like pinot noir and chardonnay and so because you like to drink and you don't want to be drunk and I like the nuance of the wine. Like, I, if I want to get drunk, I'm just going to drink some booze and some get scotch. drunk. Well, I'm more of a tequila guy or rum guy or something like that. But as far as, you know, I'm not drinking wine to get drunk. I'm drinking wine to be social and enjoy totally. it. And I think, you know, I got fortunate with the restaurant having a lot of Burgundy mm -hmm. collectors and other people there that I was able to, you know, have some of the most nuanced wine in the world and they're cerebral and it gets conversation started. And, and as well, like these lower alcohol wines, I think you really get to see them evolve in the glass much more so than a big alcohol power bomb, which is great if I'm eating a charred ribeye steak. The only thing I want is a big ass Napa cab. But if I'm just, for the most part, just drinking and not eating or drinking and eating subtly, like I like to have Pinot and Chard. I think it's a reason why they're noble grapes. And so I, real, real quickly, just popping into this just because these pinots I've, I've had once before and they're amazing the, the first one is walter scott and so we're both doing what is this the both uh eola well i mean they're both oregon so you have walter scott and then was a soder is that how you say that yeah mm -hmm. yeah tony yeah, soder from uh etude is uh north valley that's his 2012 yam hill carlton uh pinot from his de uh, i think it's called destination series where he makes uh a dundee the red label yeah, the red one's the most common or popular, the Dundee, because it's the most red fruit, most California style. Okay. But there's a blue label, a purple label, but it's a Yamhill Carlton. Eola, um, like each different AV, Dundee, some ABA. AB, Eola Amity and, and Ribbon Ridge are the different uh, AVAs represented in that series. And then the other wine is uh, Walter Scott, who I got turned on to by some uh, good friends, Charlotte and Jesse, and uh, went out there. He had... Uh, has this is their single vineyard the justice which is from bethel heights and is actually in walter scott's backyard that's really cool <laughs> and uh it's just amazing it's one of my favorite pinots in oregon right now and it's crazy that you can drink wine that's single vineyard loved by and cared for for 55 dollars. then the fact oregon that these seems like the one place that would be the one most like in I know we've debated on, you know, organic and certified and all that on this with whatever. But of all the places between Washington, Oregon, Oregon and California, Oregon would be the one place that they would do everything as sustainable. Like I picture goats running through the vineyard eating weeds versus somebody out there chopping and cutting that stuff up. They're very sustainable out there. A lot of their practices, they have the strictest laws for their sustainability laws, like whether it's salmon safe laws I mean, example, we were talking recently about the sustainability in Sonoma, and Sonoma said they're the most sustainable region on the planet yeah, Earth. 99%. 99 of the vineyards are sustainable, but you could still use Roundup. You could still use all these chemicals. You could still... It's, it's, to me, that's not really sustainable if you're spraying them with all these nasty chemicals. Whereas in Oregon, the sustainability laws say if your neighbor is spraying chemicals, you can't get a certification. 
That's crazy. Because, or if somebody upstream is spraying stuff, it's going to run downstream to you and you can't get a certification. So everybody just does it the right way up there. I just got a lot of hippies. Well, the, the big problem that they're having is from talking to the winemakers is the Christmas tree farms and the hazelnut trees are using a ton of water and they're sprayed with a ton of chemicals. And people don't think about that, that, you know, your neighbors don't even have to be grape growers. Yeah. Your neighbors could be Christmas tree farmers, which... That's crazy. I didn't even think about the amount of Christmas trees that would be coming out of Oregon. <laughs> all of them. Really? Pretty much, yeah. Field after field after field. All the hops, all the Christmas trees, all the hazelnuts. The hops, for sure. I'd imagine a lot of hop farms have, like, a lot of... Because do they only harvest one time a year for hops, right? I'm not crazy. Not a hop. I'm not sure. Samaye. I'm going to... Let's assume it's Cicerone. one time a year. Cicerone. <laughs> so you get the, the hops one time of the year, and I imagine there's certain areas where it just flourishes better than most. So, like, why have... You know, vineyards when you can have an entire hop farm, especially well, yeah, nowadays with the amount of IPAs coming out of the entire West Coast, they probably get bought up a lot. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Nice when face, you, by the way. <laughs> when you drive out of Dayton, we stayed in, we've stayed in all the different parts of Willamette Valley, but right in Dayton, when you're heading over towards the Ola Amity, you're just like, what is that? It's like, it looks like telephone poles with wiring going on, and it's just 20 foot tall hop yeah. plants, one after another after. And then on, on one side of the road, the other side of the road is Christmas tree farms, two year old trees, three year old, five year old all the way through, and it's just insanely progressive, as well as the treetops and everything else. But it, back to the uh, Pinot, Walter Scott, if you're out there uh, looking for Pinots, pick these guys up because it's not going to stay at this price for long. They're doing an awesome job, and you know, I love finding the newest thing Coloring on this one's crazy. It's so much darker than the it Walter is. Scott. Well, Man. it's such a different part of the valley, too. If you go to Eola Amity, it's all volcanic soil and more mountainous and, and just darker and bramble or or different style and then yamhill carlton is more like rolling hills of farmland and a little bit more earthy a lot more terroir in the in those uh parts as well yeah. do you yeah. have a specific area you prefer more do you like dundee ribbon eola is there like one area you go you know what like i just like those i like all of it but those that's awesome um i started out like most people just loving all the fruit in dundee and it was just big bright easy and beautiful and then I got, I love going up and, and these are the two regions that I really like. I like the Yarm Hill Carlton area, going to Flanor and going to these guys over Tony Soder. I don't know how many times I've been there, three or four times. And then Eola Amity. Soder's amazing. Yeah. They're doing a great job up there. I mean. Yeah, he's got 350 acres. He's got his, livestock. He's got full gardens. He's got a full chef working full time. The only thing you can do there is when you do your wine tastings, you have to do a food pairing to go with it. And it's all from his property as well, which is amazing. Well, I think they make some of the best bubbles in the United States, personally. Definitely. I mean, Soder? Soder. Soder bubbles are amazing. I've never tried. I keep seeing well, that because you got it. Well, it's Pinot Noir and Chardonnay producer. Yeah. Blanc de Blanc and a Brut Rosé. Yep. And also, the Yamhill region is known a lot for its uh, very organic soil, their uh, calcareous soil. Like, it's very different. Like, you're talking about the Walter Scott, Walter Scott right? Mm -hmm. That's very volcanic, where this is all, like, seashells. And it's some of the oldest soil in all of Oregon. So it's got a, I mean, they're very, the terroir in both these wines are very different. Dude, they're two totally different wines. Well, also, this is a 12. And yeah. some people think that Pinot Noir doesn't hold up. But some of the best Pinot Noirs in the world hold up beautifully. I mean, we've drank with Marty how many nights are in 70s and 80s and... 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s. Now, yeah. granted, that is obviously being burgundy. Um, Do you think Oregon has the ability to hit that same area where you could age a Pinot Noir 30, 40, 50 years? Probably not. Not at this point, but I think you can definitely age it easily 10 years, 15 years. And and I've had some of Roland Soul stuff from Rocco that are 20 years old and they're drinking gorgeous. They're, you know, the just the other day I had a 2012 Kalita from A. Fee Winery. I had Antica Terra's original stuff from... Oh five, I have oh six, or seven, oh eight. You know, is, all the are way those rocking? Because I, I still have, have a bunch of them. No. Right. but I've got all the way back, and and the wines are gorgeous. But they're they're again made for a little bit of aging as well. But but they're yeah. starting to like kind of hit that end. We're like, all right, start to drink a little sooner than. No, I think it's just all about your storage for them. If if these winemakers are putting in the effort to make them properly, because you know one of the stories all the way back to Atlas is, I had I think a Clot of all nineteen eighty, and probably. 2010 or something that was 30 years old the price tag on the wine was probably eight bucks yeah. but it was back in the day when you know he's growing everything making everything vinifying it all and 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 bottling it and it's the real wine it's not the commercial institutional version of that wine yeah and when you make something well like we all have heirloom 
furniture or anything else, you know, you buy a real piece of clothing and it lasts you for a lifetime. You buy furniture, you hand it to your grandkids, you know, it's anything made well by an artisan is going to have a lot longer staying power. That's Things so that are made by an institution or feels like it's imported from China is going to basically fall apart as soon as it's made. I was having this conversation because we're moving stuff in and out of the house and my dad gave me my bed when I was a kid. It's like this twin size made from oak. Like the slats that hold it are so solid. You could kill a bear with it if you hit it. And he's like, oh, well, your great grandfather slept in that too. And then he, your grandfather and then I had it. And I'm like, how long has this been passed on? He goes, ah, oh, they made it in the mid 1800s. Meanwhile, I had an Ikea bed that I used in college and it fell apart after two years or like two good sessions with my girlfriend. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so clearly shit just doesn't make it versus, so it's nice when I have the couple wines <laughs> that really catch me off guard. Like earlier, uh, it was the first time I was at his place. The first time I went to Atlas, I cannot remember the guy's name, but he poured us that 1973 Sterling and it was banging. Dude, it, it was, it was one of the cat clubs. Wines. Mm -hmm. And now you have a Sterling and you're like, dude, I, I can't even shelve this for 10 minutes before this falls apart. <laughs> so what our listeners don't realize, and I know you're very humble, but I'm going to say this. You probably have drank the best wine in the United States that anybody else has ever drank on a, on a yearly scale, a monthly scale, a daily scale. A lot of people try a lot of good wines. A lot of people have good sellers. You are, you surpass every master sommelier in the country. What you drink on a yearly scale, almost every master sommelier in this world would be very jealous if they knew what you actually did. And I know you're really humble about it. You don't really, you're like, eh. but I don't think there's anybody in the United States that drinks better wine than you. Or has ever drank better wine than you? Well, I feel like, and why I've done the restaurant for so long, I'm kind of working my retirement. It's worked out really, really well. I talked to my accountant, and he's the one that kind of convinces me that you could do something that might pay you better, but the perks with your job and the lifestyle you've created is, is, is one that you should just kind of stick with and don't fuck it up, basically. And it's been great. Yeah, there's nights where we're hosting the Commandery de Bordeaux on Thursday. We host the Chevalier de Testavon on Friday. We host the Food and Wine Society on Saturday, and we might open $100,000 worth of wine in a couple of days. It's like La Poly every single day of the week, and you never know who comes in. And and the, 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 the thing with the restaurant that's interesting is that everybody is not pretentious. They're all kind of just in their comfortable, you know, after work clothes and relaxing. And next thing you know, a guy pulls out some, you know, Conterno Magnums from the 70s. And, oh, do you want to share some of this? All right, I'm done drinking it. You could have the rest of the bottle. And you look it up and you're going, oh, my God, that's a $3,000 bottle. And they just left us half the bottle. I love and that's working just a Tuesday. Store. When I, I was working at AZ Wine that little bit, that was nothing better than coattailing on certain nights where he would come out and be like, hey, listen, there's a 76 Montaché in there. There's like a glass worth. Go ahead and have a little bit. And there, you just there's the racks of all the wines that just got left over. It's like having, because we were talking about tipping your server with wine and I'm like just looking at all these bottles, like how do you even... Who leaves a, like a full glass of a old bottle of Burgundy or a little bit of Screaming Eagle? It was the first time I got to try all those holy shit wines. Was working next door, polishing all the glassware, just sitting there and Oscar like, dude, you got to try ninety one Screaming Eagle. Here's Silver Oak from the seventies. Like, but even holy even shit. <laughs> even the Psalms at Eleven Madison Park, the Psalms at the best restaurants in Vegas in in Paris are not drinking what you drink. At, day in, in, day in your strip mall on a Wednesday, I mean, it's it, crazy. No, it really crazy. is. It's magical. Like it's. I don't think people even understand. I don't think. I mean, I know you understand, but you're so humble about it. Like, well, no, and it's fun, and it's it's why I've been able to secure you know three different psalms in a row at the restaurant, and as you've had on the podcast, our last psalm, Oscar, who uh -huh. uh, he was working for one of the top chefs in town here, and being their whole beverage director, and he's like. I had better wine this week than I did in my three years working for him running all of his restaurants. He's like, there's no place I could study. I can't afford to buy these wines. But once people understand I'm studying and doing this, they <coughs> share everything. So whether it's Bordeaux, whether it's Burgundy, whether it's Nebbiolo, whether it's Great Tempranillos from Spain, whether it's Have the you... finest Shirazes going back to the 70s in Australia, whether it's you name it, you know, we've had verticals of Yakem, we've had... Everything that you could possibly yeah. have in wine, you've, we've had. You've Dude, the collection out front in AZ Wines is insane. <laughs> His empty bottle collection is worth more than most people's collections are. I yeah. mean, you could probably sell those bottles. 
But oh, definitely. What I want to know is, have you ever gotten a wine certification? Are you a sommelier? I have no certification. <laughs> That's the most amazing thing about he's, this. He's but it, <laughs> it continues on. I never got my diploma from college either. It's still sitting in the office because I owe 15 bucks for a parking ticket. And I thought <laughs> they fuck themselves. That's, well, welcome to ASU. <laughs> you want your diploma? Oh my God. I owe eight hundred dollars, and they won't give me any of my credits. That for is that. fucking hilarious. So I have no certifications. I but think. Fuck I can, you, ASU. I, I think I might be able to pass one or two of them. I mean, you are one of the most knowledgeable people I know with wines. I mean, when we sit down and listen to you talk about French wines, talk about regions, and talk about single vineyards, I mean, you could spin circles around almost every sommelier I know without having any certification. All I've done is drink wine. Apparently, that's helpful. I, I Supposedly. Yeah, a lot of people read about it. I just drink it. It's like, you know, those that talk and those that do, I'm a doer. Well, I think about, there was you asked me to uh, help you out on a Christmas bar. It was a New Year's party one year. And we were posing for like an hour with the empty bottles of Latash and Homage de Jacques Perrin. They yeah, the 1998 the, Homage de Jacques Perrin from and, uh, yep. Beau Castle. It was a 100-point wine, wine of the year. And then we had a 2000... DRC. Latosh. Latosh and three liter yeah. that had sold at auction no. for $45,000. I thought they were, were they three liter or five liter? Three liters. Yeah. They it was one of liters. five made. Yeah. Like most people can't get their hands on a 750 and literally we're sitting out there. I haven't even smelled a bottle of Latosh we, after We got drink. scolded by the homeowner for not drinking them with him. Mm -hmm. He's like, why don't you have a glass? It's like, you go get a glass right now. You should drink. Oh, all right, sure. And then afterward, you, me, and uh, Marissa was helping us. I remember us out by the pool, posing with the bottles. Like that was my Facebook thing forever. I had the yeah, two, the, three the two liters in either arm, and yeah, it's going. Oh my God, what is going on? This seems that was ten years ago because I'm doing a 70th birthday party coming up. These these two bottles. You, you need help working that <laughs> together are worth more than my car. It might be your house Brand now. New. <laughs> yeah, literally. I mean. If that bottle to this day, those three liters were still open, are still unopened. They just sold at auction. The the Latosh sold for forty three thousand, and the Homage de Jacques Perrin sold for twelve thousand. So just those two bottles. Never mind everything else we opened that night. It was fifty five grand. And if you remember, we all said that the Homage was drinking better than the Latosh. The Homage was drinking ridiculous. It was. It was ridiculous. I think that the Latosh was too young at that point too, but it was. It blew it out of the water. But this is. This is what you drink. It's so crazy to think about this. Like, I understand why you've had this restaurant for 19 years now. Like, yeah, it, it justifies the slow days when you're going, eh, it's slow, but someone just decided to share X, Y, or Z with me. Yeah, guy brought in a four-year vertical of mid-70s Richborg. Like, sure, I'm going to hang out and... Mm -hmm. Let's see what, you know, all the new Montrachets are doing, and we'll bring them into Magnum just so we have enough of everything. And, <laughs> yeah. and by the way, I got to leave early, and you guys just drink the rest. You're like, I love uh, that. Okay. I don't, I guess I'm staying at work till four in the morning tonight and drinking some wine. I also like that one that, that I was working, and you did the truffle dinner, and you had a truffle that was like half the size of this bottle, basically. And just one like, well, white truffle. Oh my God. That, the whole place stunk. Like, I love the smell of truffle. And the first two courses were great. And then the third course, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm just I'm high off of truffle. <laughs> oh, it was asphyxiating. I'd never been asphyxiated by white truffle. But our restaurant Good is God. only probably 800 square feet. And so we had a one pound white truffle that we shaved over the course of, I don't know what it was, six or seven courses and just burned through this whole truffle. And the amount of off gassing or whatever it would be called from a truffle <laughs> off gassing <laughs> and filled the entire room to the point like we had to go outside to get fresh air it was <laughs> yeah. it was dude you could be in the parking lot and be like who the fuck is having truffle fries <laughs> dude i'm loving this the, honestly all right going back and forth bef between these two they're so different dude the walter scott i didn't like at first as much as i liked the soda but the walter scott definitely grew on me way more i like this walter scott a lot and it's what 2017 2017 yeah. 120 cases i think made ken and erica over there are just ridiculously amazing they are the next rock stars of of the valley they're right next door to uh, lingua franca which is another cool project by uh master Stom master Sam, uh, larry stone uh thomas ever is making his wine for him who had happened to work at maybe drc or a couple places like that and uh, what a cool part of town. Uh, Aaron Jordan from Fela is over there with his project. Yeah, and I like that one. Just that whole corner. You start realizing as you spend more time in wine regions that like everyone you like and you drive down the street, like I like that one and that one and that one might have something to do with this fucking soil. I'm not sure. I was going say. And then you drive yeah. to another part of town. You're like, I don't really like that one. Then I don't like that, 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 that. I, I guess I don't like what's going on over there. And then you. So obviously, obviously like Pino's killing it over there. But is there 
I've had like one or two gamays coming out of it. That's pretty good. Is there like another grape that you're like, dude, okay, so I know Pinot's the shine for all this, but... Chardonnay. Is, Chardonnay. Is, Chardonnay is the next greatest thing in Oregon. They're going to take over. They finally stopped planning all this Wente clone stuff and started planning all the Dijon clone. And the diurnal shift of, of the weather up there has really taken much better to it instead of kind of... The Wente clone works better with more sunshine and, and heat. It's and good it for kind California. Of goes great in California. But in Oregon, it just kind of made innocuous white wine that didn't taste like anything. It didn't taste bad, but it didn't taste good. It didn't taste like anything. It's and now, the Pinot Grigio of Oregon. <laughs> and now the Dijon clone has been awesome. And there's some people doing, you know, Bethel Heights or Castile Reserve, I think could be, you know, put in a nice lineup with a lot of French wines. You could, you know, Maggie Harrison's over Antica Terra, the, the Ex Novo, does, Walter Scott is off the charts. Does Antica Terra make a Chardonnay? They do. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh shit! I don't know but that. even the Pinot Gris up there is fantastic as well. I mean, my my buddy just opened up an old Ivory Reserve Pinot Gris that was like 15 years old. He's like, this thing was drinking unbelievably stunning. Like he couldn't believe he, he forgot about it. We all we all have those wines you forget about in the cooler. It's on the back of the rack. You're like, oh shit, I forgot about that wine for 12 years. And my buddy opened it up the other day. His old ass Pinot Gris from Ivory blew him away. Like he's still talking about it, like how good it was. I have that. I call it the fuck it box. I know it sounds stupid, but it's a it's a six pack box that sits in the back. And I threw two, six bottles into this thing. I still to this day can't remember what I shoved in there, but I'm not going to pull that out of the fridge for another 10 years. I'm just so, going to like, all right, whatever. One day we'll pull all these weird ass wines out. And it's not like it's going to be backroom box. <laughs> At least it's a stored OK. So Ivory was pretty unique when I was up there. Uh, you know, they have a lot of phylloxera actually that has hit the property. When we walked in the property, they made us put booties on. So we didn't track any phylloxera in, but they said that since all their roots go below 30 f feet below the ground, that even though phylloxera has affected a certain percentage of their, their property, the roots go below it so they can still grow it with phylloxera because they actually grow mm -hmm. below the phylloxera, which is actually pretty unique because they're, they're almost all on original rootstock up there. That's interesting because you think they'd eventually get to a point where they'd eat those roots enough that even no matter how deep it goes, they'd yeah. fucking kill the root. Yeah, I remember having the, like they're like you can't walk on our like what property you go to. Yeah, you can't walk on our property without booties. That's the way I, I mean, because it does affect up there. I mean, you heard it hit Walla Walla. Phylloxera just did. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's it's coming around. Dude, this the the Walter Scott man is like it's fresh. I mean, for me, I made a fu it's fantastic. I made a funny <laughs> face at first on the Hanzel because it actually at first smelled like dip. Hanzel, or sorry, the. Uh, Duh. It smelled like the, what? The soda dip. Oh, <laughs> it smelled like like chew, like a chew cup at first. Mm -hmm. Like it had that like okay. minty tobacco dip cup kind of at first, and that's why when I first smelled it, I went, "What?" It was kind of just like a little off putting at first, and that's completely blown off. But I love the freshness of the Walter Scott. Yeah, it's this. This is probably one of my favorite Pinot Noirs. I love the the Antica Terra is one of like the best ones I think that I had, and Bethel Heights is fantastic. But you brought this in what like. A barely a year ago yeah I, um i got turned on to these guys and then i've supported them for the last couple of vintages and been up twice to to visit with them i've been out to new york to see them at the trade shows and and promote their brands and i think it's just bees knees i i love everything that that ken and erica are doing up there and the funniest story they had was when they first got the property all they had was their trailer on the property and <laughs> they called it ddw domain double wide <laughs> and awesome. they're the most humble people ever. But why? Why? Where did the name Walter Scott come from? Then I believe, from what I, uh, Walter, I believe is the name of Ken's great grandfather, and so he kind of. I want to say he was possibly a airline mechanic for TWA back in the day, and just kind of, kind of, you know, built the roots of the family and kind of did that. And I believe Scott was possibly his nephew who had died at a really young age. And so there are two influential people on in his life. And so I believe he named the winery Walter Scott after uh, both okay. his uh, grandfather and his uh, So it's a nephew. combination of names. Mm -hmm. Good. Because I was always told to not trust somebody with two first names. Yeah, neither of them never, are his Never name. dated a girl with two first names. Yeah. I think that's, that's the scary one. Yeah, I think it, his name Hi, is Cheryl Ken Landon. Plow and, and her name is Erica <laughs> Landon. And, uh, but these are related to them and uh, as far as people and uh, doing that. So you were just in New Zealand. Correct. I was in Australia and New Zealand for the summer. And, and you uh, drank a lot of Pinot Noir, I'm assuming. 
I did. I uh, enjoyed all the regions of New Zealand getting to uh, try all the Pinot because I was as ignorant as everybody else. And, you know, you kind of taste some lush Pinots from Martinborough and you have some kind of astringent Pinots kind of from Central Otaga and whatever they bring in. And usually it's the bulk stuff that they bring here. There's not a lot of single vineyard anything. And, you know, I'm fortunate. I have a couple of Kiwi friends who are in the wine world and they've brought some really cool Pinots and had you know, increase my interest there. And so what I had done this summer is rented a car up in uh, Auckland and drove it all the way down to Wellington and stopped in, well, I went over to Waiheke Island and got to see that they had all these Bordeaux varietals that I'd never seen come over here that were just amazing. Growing, you know, two, three, four hundred dollar bottles of Bordeaux varietal, beautiful New Zealand wines that just don't really make it here. And then going down to Hawke's Bay and trying the beautiful Syrahs and you know, some Bordeaux Blancs and other things that they were growing over there. That was just awesome. And then down to Martinborough and trying kind of their lush kind of Russian River Valley version of it. And then we flew over to the South Island and went over to uh, Central Otago to Bannockburn and, and the rest of the regions over there and went and visited with Felton Road and Burn Cottage and tried some really cool stuff. And a lot of American winemakers are over there now and getting involved with the projects, Ted, Ted Lemons from Literize with Burn Cottage and doing like a lot of really fun matrix style, you know, this plot is to this varietal, this is, or not even to varietal, but uh, to this clonal material, this is done this way and this type of farming and this row is spaced it this way and just doing a lot of experimenting. Their whole wine region is maybe only 25 years old, maybe 30 years. So it makes Oregon look old at this point. And so they're both experimenting and I kind of felt like I had seen a lot of similarities of the two regions. And just kind of didn't realize the diversity, though, of, uh, I guess, latitude there, because, you know, Central Otago is the most southern in the world growing wine, re wine growing region in the world. And then yep. to see the I missed that question on my exam. Did you? Yep. I wouldn't <laughs> miss it, I know it. I might pass that one. I, <laughs> I haven't taken the test, but so, I think I can pass it. So do you feel like your perception of the region completely changed after going there 100 percent. to just be in hawks bay and to see the ocean being maybe 300 meters from the vineyards is crazy i hadn't seen anything like that you know like you hear all these people in california like oh we're only two miles three miles four miles from the ocean you're like these guys are like i could throw a rock from the vineyard to the to the ocean and to see what they're doing there as well as just to just to hang out all, you know, we were fortunate we were there for a while. And so, you know, you're just in Martinborough and you see it just kind of be dewy every morning and super lush. And you're at a low elevation, basically at like sea level. And to kind of see that, you know, those wines are much more jammy and full, full bodied and, and what have you, like wonderful properties like Atarangue that are escarpment that are doing things over there. And then to go down to central Otago where it's way more mountainous and everything's growing up and it's, way you know just completely different soils and and topography and rocky you know not even soil but just rocks that they're growing through and the struggle that these vines are going through and they're they're making world caliber rieslings at felton road and making awesome pinots and doing gewurz and some other stuff that are just like oh this is so different and that we will probably never see here either because they just they're not going to export it they don't make enough it's expensive by the time it gets here without a doubt it's hard I'm, I'm trying to do my best after you know getting this newfound passion for these wines and trying to bring them into the little boutique store and you know i found that burn cottage with you know claire over there who's a wonderful person you know is, is importing now through quench and so i'm going to start bringing those wines in and then mount difficulty is uh with young's market here and so i'm going to start bringing those <laughs> wines cool, in and so I, that is a cool name. Mount difficulty. Yeah. And so just, you know, slowly but surely. And some of the other wineries, Atarangue was here but left because people don't think of, they kind of, you know, lump in New Zealand Pinot all as one thing. That yep. would be like saying California Pinot is all one thing. But if you've had a Pinot from Santa Rita Hills, Santa Cruz Mountains, Russia River Valley, Carneros, and, and Napa, you're going to go... These are not the same wines by any stretch of the imagination, nor should they be. Or just United States Cabernet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just use United States as Cabernet. I mean... But I'm just thinking of California being yeah. about the same size as... as uh, New Zealand. New Zealand going... This is same just, thing, you know, top to bottom, too. <laughs> such a wide range, you know? It's, you know, 60 degrees up here, and it's snowing down south, you know? They're, they're, you know, the, the elevation, the, the climate, the longitude, it's all different. And, and so it was, a, it was an awesome learning experience, and... You know, I credit my son to putting up with my antics and, and going to all these wineries and thank God but, for iPads and cell phones. And, but he uh, gets to eat, though, all the food, too. How, was, how actually was the food there? 
I thought well, it was great. I, I, the, the, the freshness and quality in New Zealand reminded me of places like France and Monaco that, you know, it's almost illegal to be not organic. It's, I've never seen a country, the entire country of New Zealand, not a single egg was in a refrigerator. That'll just tell you yep. how fresh everything is. There's, oh, that's interesting. I didn't even you know, if that. you go to bar food, every, you know, organic is anything like, is that organic? No, by, by everything it is organic. Is. Yep. It would be almost illegal for things not to be organic. It's amazing. The air quality, they're, they're carbon negative. Their air quality is pristine. Their water quality is pristine. Their, just the amount of livestock to people is, is, is outrageously inverted. You know, there's, I think, I forget what the numbers are, but the amount of sheep and cattle to person is just nuts. And the quality of the meats, you know, and, and it was interesting. We got to stay in Martinborough for a while and we were going to the butcher shop thinking like, oh, we're going to have this great lamb for dinner. And we go, I'm like, what do you got? He's like, I just got fish in, man. You got to buy the fish. And I'm like, but I'm here to buy the meat. He's like, no, 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 no. You got to just trust me. I got this beautiful fish in from, from the coast, and this is what I'm eating for dinner, and this is what you're going to be eating for dinner. What kind of uh, influence is there on the cuisine? Is it just basically like grilled meats with like good vegetables and a good potato, or do they have an influence from like France or influence from Spain? Is there any influence from European nations? Because I think of Spanish food being a direction, French food is a direction. I can't think of what New Zealand food would taste like. I think of it would just be well, like... Well, it depends upon what part of New Zealand you're in. It, it varies a whole lot. Places like Auckland and Wellington are much more influenced by Asia. So both Indian, Indian is huge in, in, in New Zealand. So some of the best Indian food I'd had. So a lot of curries and... Yeah, just traditional style Indian food in both Wellington and Auckland were, were huge. There was, as well as kind of just the farm to table movement is, is, you know, local indigenous foraging. One of the best meals I've had probably in my life, I would say even, is uh, at a place called Pasture in Auckland. And it's a former rugby player from England who uh, got injured, got a settlement, decided he wanted to become a chef and started working in Auckland and is doing everything. It's him and two sous chefs, one of the sous chefs from Noma, and they're doing some of the coolest stuff. Everything's over an open hearth that's probably 10 feet wide. And they're starting out your meal with gooey duck and, you know, killing the order cooking that, cooking, you know, beautiful snapper and hiramasa and et cetera, uh, you know, domestic wagyu that they're raising over there as well and just doing really cool stuff. Uh, burgers are huge in, in New Zealand for whatever reason. They love their burgers, especially fur burger down in a... In a fur Queenstown. burger? Yeah, fur burger is uh, the number one burger place in Queenstown. Okay. They, must, they must do... God knows, thirty, fifty thousand dollars a day, every day, and they're just amazing. I, they have, just had, I think everybody at some point had a fur burger in their life, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> it just hit me. Yeah, Ferg. So uh, Ferg. they have a Ferg uh, bakery as well, and just that's pretty cool. But there's a the just a lot of things are based off of high quality cheeses and meats, and you know they eat a lot of elk and venison and. And those kind of things are just there's there's plenty of land. Sheep is endless as well, so all sorts of lamb dishes and see. This is how you know he's a food guy. Like I I think again, I think he's more of a food person than a wine person. He just went on a seven minute rant about dude. Like like, like, honestly, you could see it. He's not even at the table anymore. He's already he's flashback. He's like the guy who talks about Vietnam, man. Like when I was back in the day, except it's all food driven. Just like you gotta have this food, you gotta have this food, you gotta have this food. No, I had a close Saint Henri. I know the wine I had with every single meal. I could tell you every single thing I had there. But it is true. Because every summer you close the restaurant for six to eight weeks and you take a food trip. And you're not going to France and Burgundy and all these places. You've gone to Southeast Asia. You've gone to China. You've gone to New Zealand. And, I mean, Grant, maybe New Zealand was a little bit for the wine. But really, I mean, these are food trips for you. Yeah, it's just food and exploring. I love hiking. I love outdoors and adventure. And I travel a lot with my son. And so... I've, you know, I've gotten to go to enough wineries in my lifetime for many people. And so it's really boring for him to kind of sit at a winery and taste this kind of stuff. And so it's kind of fun to just explore other places. And so he has a common bond with me with the food thing. So I'd love to explore with him. And he's not old enough to drink yet. A lot of places have looked the other way. In America. In this country. He's drank plenty in this country as well. Most people, usually when when you kind of play it cool, they let you kind of do your thing. I've said it to him. I got very lucky. My family was very good enough to take me visiting, and I never appreciated it until I hit a certain age. And I look back on it and go, man, 
at the time I didn't seem to care as much, but now I'm like, dude, I'm so like, it was so cool to go. Like when I went to China and Hong Kong and went through all that. And then when I was over in Europe for that time, being like, I can't believe my parents took me to these places. And I still, to this day, remember every place we ate, like we did a Sicilian dinner one night and we went up the mountain and they just had the volcano like erupted. So the ski lifts were actually just barely sticking above the rock. And we had dinner at eight o'clock at night and it went to like 11 o'clock at night. It was one of the best things ever, but I was too young to give a shit. And now I look back, go, dude, that was one of the coolest damn things that I had ever done. Yeah, Same thing in the, China. China had some of the best food ever, but holy crap, their portions were like this big. <laughs> like no, no wonder everybody's tiny. Yeah, it was pretty cool. My son, I think one of the things that he enjoyed was we were in, I think, Barcelona maybe, and we go to dinner. And I think we uh, got out of dinner or we went to dinner at nine o'clock because nothing even opens before then. We get out of dinner at maybe 11, 1130. And He's like, oh, isn't it kind of late to be eating? And I'm like, of course not. You know, like this is normal for dad and, and, and mom for this instance. And so we're going and we get out and all these kids are playing at the playground. It's 1130 at night and they just had dinner. And he's like, I think I could live here. This is amazing. Like everybody took their siesta. Now they're going out to a nice dinner. They had dinner. Now they're going to go play it all off. And you just kind of see a different lifestyle of just, you know, kind of living in the moment and enjoying life. And, you know, we've been to lots of countries that. You were, remember you were telling me the story about your kid in Japan, how like the people were bowing and your kid was trying to get to the end of the street. He's like, Dad, they're still bowing. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Budigami in Tokyo was just amazing. We ate there and they normally don't even like kids in this restaurant. And Aiden, my son, is a, a pretty good diner at this point. And so they're, they didn't care that he was eating there. We eat, we leave, and then the whole staff walks outside and bows as you're leaving the restaurant. And we're, you know, probably a half mile down the road. We kept looking back. They're still bowing. We keep going, like basically almost eye shot, and he's got great eyesight. He's like, Dad, they're so bowing. He's <laughs> like, I was like, Yeah, they, they appreciate the fact that you came in and, and supported them and, you know, appreciate what they do. And he just loved it. It was your, really cool. Your poor kid is so screwed later in life. He's so spoiled. He gets into college and eats Chipotle at least seven times a week. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, we were talking the other day. You're like, you're like, oh, so what do you want to go for dinner? He's like, oh, maybe we should go to like the Four Seasons. You're like, uh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> like, no, it's definitely hard when your idea. Don't, of don't let him. Don't let him drink at your place. You'll definitely like, ruin uh, it forever. Yeah, if yeah. your idea of sushi is eating in Japan, if your idea of you know eating pasta is going to Italy, and your idea of eating Chinese food is being in if Shanghai, an average, if an average wine night you're, is at Atlas, you're screwed. You're 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 gonna become jaded. But he loves to cook, and I think he appreciates you know the hard work that goes into these foods, and so. You made him a Red Sox fan. Without a doubt. God. Well, I hate both Hey, this ain't our year, so. but last year wasn't too bad. I think we did okay. Yeah. So these wines, what do you think of both of them? John and I gave our opinions. Um, I know you love the Walter Scott. Yeah, and I love the, the North Valley from Tony Soder. I, I, I really like that region. I've, like I said, I've spent a lot of time there. And it's just what a dichotomy in the two wines. The, the, the color, the flavor... The palette just just they're almost completely different. It's they're completely different, ones. and they're probably only if you drove from Tony Soders to Walter Scott, maybe it'd take you 20, 25 minutes, yeah. not much, and it's night and day. And granted, Oregon definitely has an amazing soil composition, and studying Oregon is really cool. I know a lot of people have gotten into that and kind of. It is hard to believe that this is seven years old at this point. It's drinking great. I mean, it doesn't taste like a seven-year-old Pinot Noir. I mean, there's a lot of California Pinots that would be dead after four. Yeah. Dude, with the amount of, like, over-extraction and everything that you get out of Russian River sometimes. Plus, honestly, Russian River, in some cases, from top to bottom, it just tastes like a flat cola. It gives the universal flavors with some small things. This is... Dude, this is comparing Napa Valley floor to, like, the highest-end Napa Valley mountain fruit. It's just... It's not even on the same plane. It's still Pinot, but not. it's not in the same boat. Well, no, and this Pinot would do so well with a nice piece of grilled lamb. Not to get back to the lamb train, but I think I maybe want some lamb. But. It's the one thing I do yeah. like, and it, I think it's why I like Nebbiolo the most, is because of how different each site is, and I can appreciate what Pinot does. But I've never had the holy shit Pinots. I've never had the Burgundies or any of those things, so I don't know. But I do know Nebbiolo, how crazy different. A little slope here, a little slope here, 50 feet to the left, 50 feet to the right. That old Giuseppe peed on that vineyard and Franco peed on the other vineyards. Tastes all different. This is the first time I've had Oregon Pinot side by side. Like, we've done a lot of Oregon Pinot. But side by side, dude, they're both on the same level, but not even 
They don't even taste the same. Well, there's 420 Oregon wineries. So we've that's done it. We've done 200, or oh, we've done that's surprising. Yeah, yeah. Four, there's about there's 420. <laughs> I missed that part. Yeah, no, that's very that's very Oregon like. Yep. So we've done two wines. That's it so far. Pretty much on the. Po- I don't think we've done another Oregon wine really in the podcast. Well, we yet. drink it, but yeah, we haven't done an Oregon wine on yeah. the podcast. So, so we have 418 left to do. Yeah. For well, the funny thing was, my dad, the Napa Cab guy, he probably wouldn't care as much about Walter Scott, but he liked this, the Red Label. When you brought the Red Label to him, he liked that one. He did. You know, they Soder makes great wines, and I'm going to give them props too because they finally upgraded their Planet Oregon Pinot. It was the, the most label? god awful label I've ever seen on a great. That's wine. them. Planet, Planet Oregon, Oregon. That terrible That's label. Their, yeah, the new label's badass. We've been talking about this. Yeah, that old label looked like I made it. At it looked home. like something from Idaho or New Mexico. I mean, it was like it no, was, it was print shop. It was bad. Yeah, like high Lego gloss, logo print shop kind of. It shit. was horrible. But that says a lot about how much packaging actually truly means on your wines. And I was talking to the lady from Soder at the trade show just recently, and I was like, thank God you changed this. It's so amazing. She's like, yeah, we tried for a while to get this changed, but they love that old label. But it was bad. It was that, really was, bad. that was just their nostalgia. Their granddaughter drew it uh, when she was four, and it went on their fridge. <laughs> They'll sell twice as much with the new label. Yeah. Just because it looks classy. It looks better. It's not gloss finish. No, See, and they is, have no problems anyhow. With their Mineral Springs Ranch, I think it... That's their, that's their big one. 96 points almost year in, year out. And Tony's reputation in the wine community, everybody loves him from Etude. And if you can ever go up there and go get his bottle of his uh, 2000, I think, seven proprietary red, it's the last wine he made at Etude. And part of the buyout clause was he got X number of barrels of his old cab blend. And he's doing a prop red from 07 is the last year. But I think it's 150 bucks a bottle or so, but it's lights out. Do you ever do uh, Oregon Pinot Camp? I've never got to go to Pinot Camp. I've, I've never, no one invites me to anything. I have no certifications. I got no invites. I got to do everything maybe, myself. Maybe my life changes no and I happen to get like into the wine business. We could do Pinot Camp together. Without a doubt. The sorrows Todd has. <laughs> <laughs> He's only drinking like Japan and New Zealand. Oh, poor Todd. Sorrow. <laughs> Don't forget the Israeli is... wines of the Golan Heights and... Man, these are bit, these are those are some fun well, stuff. Well, I was actually thinking about this before the podcast. Was I was actually in Atlas Bistro the first time I ever had Switzerland Pinot Noir. You have probably had Pinot Noir. I, uh, Rich Farini brought it in. Uh-huh. Like he was dining. He's like Damien. I was just walking in to say hi to you, and he's like, "Come try this wine." That's the great thing about Atlas Bistro is mm-hmm. people just do that. The Swiss make great wines. Yeah, especially with the climate changing now too. They're going to be onto stuff. I'm tr- I don't think there's probably a single growing region in um, the world that makes Pinot Noir that you probably haven't tried their Pinot Noir. Probably not. Unfor- or fortunately, I guess. Did you try any wines in China? I had a little bit of wine in China. Um, I went over to the Roosevelt Club because of my, uh, you know, God, Anthony Bourdain, and uh, his in- in- enticement to go over to the... Uh, Roosevelt Club and go hang out at the Pudong in uh, Shanghai and drink some wine over there. I didn't have any native Chinese wine while I was there, but a mutual friend of ours, Tony, had mm-hmm. shared some uh, northern China dessert wine that was absolutely amazing and okay. uh, really cool stuff. His wine merchant had sent it to him, and that was the only thing I'd had for Chinese wine at this point. And, uh, and I think in Japan, mostly had a whole lot of sake. I had a little bit of wine. Nobu brings in some... Uh, from, uh, I think, Anna's Garden. And it's actually a Concord grape wine that's just ridiculous. One of the best aromatics I'd ever had. And On a Concord grape wine? Yeah. You are such a wealth of knowledge with wine. I can't... Some AAs in this world are got to be so jealous of you. And they don't even know who you are because you're just working at this like little tiny bistro. You're not like working at some... Like... I'm head waiter now, though. Ooh, Congratulations. Okay. Took you 19 years. <laughs> Slowly but surely. That's because, that's cause Os- that's cause Oscar left. Pretty much. <laughs> And Oscar was hanging out with that uh, Aubert de Villain's uh, Boozeron project today. I saw the pictures. Yeah, he was teasing me all day. And so it's nice to uh, live vicariously through him right now. I can't believe we've had two Atlas Bistro people on now in the last four episodes. I feel Next like, thing I, is going to be the like uh, Chop Champion yeah, Chef. I, I feel like I should like do like a special dinner at your restaurant. Like We should just buy it out like the Wednesday, the uh, It's probably October a 30th, 30th day. You know? <laughs> like, I don't I know. Mean, what kind of wines are you going to bring? <laughs> Let me see the wine list first, and then we'll hey, determine Charles if you Shaw can Charles Shaw has a new rosé. That's $4. Cote, Cote de Boone from Boone's Farm. Heck yeah. <laughs> Boonies. 
Yep. Shout to Newfie to Poopy. Those could be a pretty tasty. It's going to be a poopy night. You know, there's going to be some bad wines, I'm sure, that's going to show up. There's going to be one person that's going to bring something and be like, what did you bring? Why do you keep looking at John when you say that? Well, because we know who we're talking about. <laughs> no, since we found out you don't do a corkage fee on scotch, John's bringing scotch. I already know that. I'm totally not bringing the 18-year-old 18 18 year Lafroy. We know your dad's going to bring it now that he knows. Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> All right, so Atlas Bistro, um, anyone that wants to make a reservation, 990-CHEF. That's 480, right? Yep, 990-CHEF. Is it really? 990-2433. Back when you used to have to dial on your phone, <laughs> it was 990-CHEF. You, that's that's how like old I am. Welcome to Movie Phone. Yeah. Welcome to You Chef. have ordered the meatloaf. <laughs> Atlas <laughs> Bistro, not open on Mondays and Tuesdays. Or Sundays. <laughs> or Sundays. Or summer. <laughs> or <laughs> because we don't want you to be here. So you're typically open, what, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four days a week? Wednesday through Saturday. And you only take reservations between 6.45 and 7.15? <laughs> to accommodate all of the Scottsdaleans. <laughs> okay, we got you covered. If you're not from Scottsdale, we can take reservations before 6.45 and after 7.15. Hey, uh, rumor has it the great dinner that's coming up on the uh, 30th is at 6.30. Perfect. Yeah. Only eight tickets remaining, probably, if I take a guess at if there were tickets. <laughs> It'll be sold out before I post this episode. Yeah, probably. So. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing these wines and the champagne that we didn't get a saber. <laughs> that might have been the greatest introduction of any single episode we've ever had. Yeah. The non-saber. The non-saber. The non-saber. Hey, the, that's the name of the episode, the non-saber saber Honestly, episode. champagne was amazing. Uh, we need to drink more champagne on this episode. We need to drink more champagne with you. I, mean, I would really love to do. share champagne with you at any time I have. Yeah, we got to do this again. We'll do this again. No, we got to do, We actually have to pull off the champagne sabering. I think we do a whole champagne sabering thing where we all saber champagne. I'll bring three bottles. We'll all actually Every 30 saber. minutes. We I'm just... down. John, have you ever sabered a bottle in your life? Nope. I can't say I have. Awesome. Have you, Damien? Oh, yeah. Okay. We did a sabering competition at my old house once. Okay. But it was with Kavas. We did uh, a competition for height, length, and most unique uh, vessel. Well, I told Damien I want to do a, sh- uh, a saber draw, so we walk ten paces, turn, and saber at each other. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. We'll put goggles on for safety reasons. Someone's gonna lose an eye. Someone's gonna be a pirate. At yeah, the end probably. Of this. You know, maybe a nut here and there. I feel like James Taylor needs to be part of this. We'll bring James Taylor. Of Smooth, course. Easy listening. Oh yeah, he sees fire. He sees rain. <laughs> <laughs> he sees Terry's thesis book and his uh, <laughs> sample budget. <laughs> totally. All right, we'll ruin his sample budget next time we can. Without a doubt. Todd, awesome. Any, anything else you want to say about who you are, what you do? No, I just say uh, support your local independent wine stores and uh, independent restaurants. And I agree. You know, we get up, work our asses off, and uh, if you can support us, we appreciate it. And uh, we do it for the love of the game, not for the money. So appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Uh, you're you literally have my favorite restaurant in the entire state. You know I'm a huge supporter. I'll continue to support it whether you're open for another two years, five years, twenty years, thirty years. You know I'll, I'll always be supporting Atlas Atlas Bistro. Cheers, cheers, guys. Thank cheers. you so much for listening again. Check out Atlas Bistro episode. if you're ever in town. <laughs> Bye, guys. That's so fucking hilarious. I still can't believe you fucked up the saber. I can't.